Det kom tre jungfru vandrande. Den första var solen, den andra var månen, den tredje jungfru Maria. Det band den slämma mora med silverband, med guldband, så fast som den and i mörker hedens länkar. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander Ath, and today we are so excited to be talking about the power of narrative charms with Carl Nordblom. Okay, so what is a charm? And what are troll formulae? And how are the narratives of myth and history and esotericism kind of woven directly into the application of a charm's power? Well, the perfect person to ask is Carl Nordblom, a practitioner and esotericist and the author of Historiola, The Power of Narrative Charms from Hadean Press. In this wonderful tome, Carl shares about how the native Scandinavian tradition of troll formulae uses short narratives where a powerful protagonist like the saints, Jesus, Mary, three maidens, or many other mythical figures perform a required action to heal or hex. He also shares about the storytelling aspect woven into the charm and how it manifests sympathetic magic through the protagonist. In this podcast, Carl shares different examples of narrative charms. He walks us through the charm-infused topography of Historiola. Carl shares about how charms are carriers of power. And Carl also discusses the differences between charms and ceremonial magic, how troll formulae are protected magically. And Carl as well answers your wonderful Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions. Also, thanks to each and every patron supporter of the podcast. You are the reason the podcast continues to grow in new and interesting ways. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome Carl Nordblom. Nordlum, thank you so much for stopping by the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely presentation. That was excellent. I'm a long-term listener to Glitch Bottle, so it's wonderful to be able to be with you today and, uh, and answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Could you perhaps share with listeners who might be wondering, well, what is a charm? What does a charm sound like? Do you have perhaps a few charms that you'd like to recite and uh, translate for us? Of course, of course. The book in and of itself is, of course, about these narrative charms. And specifically, I'm going to read you a couple of narrative charms from the Norse magical tradition that are usually referred to as troll formulas. I'll read you two of them, first in, in Swedish, and then I'll do a translation into English so you'll get the gist of it. So the first one is actually the one that you can find depicted on the cover of, of my book. And uh, it goes something like this. Det kom tre jungfrur vandrande. Den första var solen, den andra var månen, den tredje jungfrur Maria. Det band den slämma mora med silverband, med guldband, så fast som den and i mörker hedens länkar. And translated, that should be something along the lines of There came maidens wandering. The first was the sun, the second the moon, the third was Virgin Mary. They bound the bad uterus with silver thread, with gold thread, as firm as the spirit is bound in the chains of the dark valley. And I just thought that, was a, that is a lovely perfect example of these kind of troll formulas and how the narrative charms make use of these very powerful symbols and also it's quite enigmatic. You're not really certain what, what actually is going on, but you at least get some kind of um, taste of what, what they can sound like, what they sort of, uh, how they function. Secondly, I'm going to read a bit longer one. 
And this one uh, I'm quoting from a fantastic book on the Norse magical practice that's called Trolldom, Spells and Methods of Norse Folk Magic Tradition by Johannes Björn Gordbeck. And it goes something along the lines of this. Det gick en finne på havstrand. Han kunde göra för alla skott som i världen var. Han kunde göra för finskott, för blodskott, för trollskott. För ont av vatten, för ont av jorden, för ont av väder, för hat, för avund, för verk och plågor. Han kunde göra för all slags skott som i världen var. And in translation that would be something along the lines of There was a Finn who walked on the seashore. He could counter all the shots that were were in the world. He could counter for fin shots, for blood shots, for troll shots, for evil from the water, for evil from the earth, for evil from the weather, for hate, for envy, for ache and torments. He could do all the kinds of shots that were in the world. So that's a bit longer one. And of course, uh, what is a Finn? A Finn is, of course, a person from Finland, but uh, it could also be a more generic term for a Sami or the people belonging to the Sami culture that lives far up north in Norway and in Sweden. And they are almost like they're well known for being great magicians. So it's it's almost like an archetypical mage, you could say, that's that's called upon or retold in this narrative genre. And of course, it covers so many different kind of afflictions. This person, this Finn, can counter all kinds of shots. And a shot is something along the lines of any kind of supernatural kind of affliction, basically, uh, something that's come immediately and you don't really know exactly where it comes from. It might be from the trolls, it might be from another person, but this kind of historiola, this, uh, this narrative charm is to counter all those kinds of things. So those are the two that I wanted to read for you today. You can feel this just amazing esoteric gravity with with your recitations, Carl. I, I, I know I do, and I'm sure many listeners do. And can you just share with us, Carl, about growing up in Scandinavia? How did you first become exposed to to charms and to troll cunning formulae? How did that how did that all come about for you? Yeah, I mean, when I was younger, I wasn't really that much exposed to these things. The tradition in the folk magical tradition in Scandinavia is not that popular these days. I mean, over the course of the last hundred years or so, it's been declining quite quite a bit. So when I became interested in, in magic, mysticism and the occult, I was rather exposed to other forms of cultures and even folk magical practices from other cultures rather than my own. But I always knew that there were these forms of practices in my own native country. And when I started to look into them, I found that they were mainly preserved within these books that are usually referred to as Svartkonstböcker or Black Arts books. In Norway and Denmark, they're usually referred to as Cyprianus books uh, because they're related to, of course, St. Cyprian of Antioch. And they're a little bit like a cunning folk or cunning men's handbooks. Uh, and they include recipes and forms of love magic and necromancy and what have you. All kinds of magical practices and, and even more like uh, herb lore and things like that as well. And the main kind of charms that you find within these books are actually these kind of troll formulas or narrative charms. And when I read them first, sort of on a more theoretical level, uh, I didn't really understand them in all honesty. I, I sort of got a perhaps a, a glimpse of what, uh, what they were supposed to do, but I did not really properly understand them in all honesty. A few years later, I, I started to become a lot more practically inter interested in this tradition. And I got an apprenticeship uh, with my teacher, uh, Johannes Gordebeck. And he taught me after a while 
his approach and his understanding of of these narrative charms. And it was when I started to follow his advice and actually look into them genuinely practically, that's when they sort of unlocked for me and I, and I understood them a bit firmer. And I got pretty good results with them as well, with trying them out in, in daily life and also trying them out for clients and things like that during my, uh, during my practice. And I started to think more and more about them and, and I started to read more about them from scholarly papers and, and things like that. And I soon realized that this is not a practice or a method that's just found in the Scandinavian tradition, but rather something quite universal, actually. The narrative charms are, can be found in, in most cultures and in most periods of, of time, actually. And you can find them in ancient Vedic scriptures. You can find them in ancient Mesopotamia. You can find them in ancient Rome, ancient Greece, and so on and so forth. So my interest in them just grew, and both on a you know, uh, philosophical level, but also on, on sort of a practical level. And I discovered that there weren't that much written on them uh, properly from a practitioner's point of view. You can find a lot of sort of scholarly papers by religious historians, but nothing genuinely written from someone that practiced them today. Uh, so that's basically the, uh, the background story of why I wrote the book. To your wonderful point about being in a tradition, learning from somebody, apprenticing yourself, and then sharing this, you really helped me understand reading your book about the terms and the different ways that words are used. So can you just share with us, Carl, about, you know, what are some of the basic terms when it comes to these? You know, like what does trolldom actually mean? What, what is historiole or, or any other terms that, that you think uh, listeners should be familiar with? Should we begin with what trolldom means, perhaps? Uh, I mean, it's kind of an odd term, perhaps, for a lot of people. Um, so basically, trolldom can be seen as a generic term to describe uh, the folk magical traditions of Scandinavia uh, or the Norse countries. So countries like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and that's just a basic definition. So it's, it's about the, the folk magical traditions of these countries. And when we look at the, the term, you get, of course, two words, troll and dom. And troll, I suppose a lot of, a lot of your listeners are, are aware of the, sort of the contemporary understanding of what a troll is both perhaps somebody who's nasty to you online or whatever, <laughs> or also more perhaps traditionally uh, kind of a generic term to describe a sort of a forest-dwelling entity uh, of sorts, quite similar to what you can find in the British word fey or fairy, perhaps. But in Swedish, at least, I think, I believe it's the same in, in Norway and Denmark. The word troll is something along the lines of a suffix. So anything that's related to magic, basically, is described as trollish in nature. So you could uh, have a word like wand, a magical staff, uh, and that's a troll staff in Swedish, or a practitioner of magic, a male practitioner of magic would be a troll man or a female practitioner of magic would be a troll woman. So basically anything that's related to magic is described as, yeah, trollish. And then the word dom is basically the same as the English word uh, domain. So you could say more or less that trolldom is the domain of things of magic. So the domain of magic. And it sort of encompasses the the things that I spoke about earlier, the uh, kind of techniques of healing, harming, um, necromancy, love magic, luck magic. And it's remained basically the same kind of practices for, I don't know, since ancient, the ancient period, moving along time to, to more modern times. So um, you can find very, very similar elements from, I don't know, the Viking Age to, to contemporary practices. Um, of course, with some changes here and there, of course. 
But yeah, it's basically a generic term to, to describe the folk magical tradition of Scandinavia. In a past, it's been used also as sort of a legal term, you could say, where trolldom has been used in the same way as perhaps witchcraft has been used. So it's kind of a, not a positive term always. So practitioners of trolldom might not have referred to themselves as practitioners of trolldom. They rather have, could have referred to themselves as klok, as in knowing or kuklare or lövare or something along the lines of that. Uh, it's more along the lines of what you can find in uh, the English term cunning. This is a kind of a cunning craft in many ways and has a lot of similarities to the British kind of cunning craft as well. And as I mentioned earlier, it, the practices are usually related to what you can find in these black arts books, the, the Svartkonstbøker or the Cipriani. So uh, if you're curious to learn more about this, I, I would recommend you uh, trying to get hold of some translated black arts books. There, there should be some out there. And then if we move on to <laughs> yeah, historiola, it's kind of a modern academic term, actually. And literally, it just means a short story. So it's more or less an incantation that has the structure of a short story. Of course, you can also say narrative charm, basically. So it's a written or spoken charm that has a magical function, and it's in the form of a narrative. That's about it. One of the things that really, really struck me, Carl, when I was reading your book, among many other things, is the immediacy of these charms, that that these charms have a potency. You mentioned, for example, that, quote, unlike ceremonial forms of magic, here, no spirits or powerful beings are summoned and compelled or commanded to perform an action on behalf of the magician. Within these charms, you say... Such beings are fully established characters locked within a highly specified pattern of performances and events, unquote. So, Carl, given that, can you maybe sketch out for us the basic structure of a narrative charm? What does, what does it look like? Yeah, I mean, it's different from narrative charm to narrative charm, I suppose. But uh, I think one easy way of looking at it is that it follows the same kind of structure as a basic sentence, more or less. I mean, in a basic sentence, you have a subject, object, and a verb. So you have someone or something that does something. And the historiola follows this, that same, very same kind of uh, structure. You have a powerful character, usually a saint or a deity or a magician or or even actually sometimes just an animal or just a, a natural force or something doing something. Uh, it could be a miracle. It could be something healing. It could be just a, a natural state of affairs that's occurring. So that's why they are kind of locked within that sequence of someone or something doing something. That's also why I sort of argue in the book that they have kind of a very firm structure and conclusive structure, not only because they are structured like yeah, a natural sentence, but also because they're usually in the past tense. So what we can draw out of that is that the thing has already happened. It's like saying... And so it is done, perhaps. Amen, you know. It's already concluded. So we don't have a guess, really. We don't have to hope that it's going to happen, wish that it's going to happen. The process has already been done. So in more ceremonial forms of magic, we usually want to summon a spirit, first and foremost, and then uh, or compel it to, to come and then ask them to undertake a certain task or make a pact with them and, and, and so on and so forth. And then hopefully the spirit will undertake it. Rather, within the historiola, 
we already take all these sort of steps for granted and they have already been performed, so to speak. So that's why I sort of argue that this is a lot neater kind of practice in, in some ways. Then again, ceremonial magic has a lot of other benefits to it as well. It, it's a lot less perhaps rigid structure. It's more of a practice that involves a variety of methods in and of itself. And it's more interactive with the spirits and so on. Whilst the Historiola is a bit more, yeah, you could say, short and sweet. <laughs> and sometimes, as you mentioned in the book, Carl, the, the histories, you know, whether it be of, you know, Jesus or Mary or uh, of mythology, they might not even be things that that happened or they might not even be parts of the kind of quote unquote canon of myth but these characters are still being used can you just can you just talk about that about how there is this drawing from the rich history and mythological tradition well they usually make use of classical narratives or classical stories or at least characters that you can find in, in classical myths and so on. And of course, this is kind of culture dependent, I would guess, where you would find Jesus or Mary or some of the saints as protagonists in the narrative charms of, uh, from Christian uh, countries or in Christian periods. Whilst, of course, you would find the Buddha as the protagonist within Indian or, or Tibetan uh, narrative charms. Or you would find deities like Artemis or, or even the Homeric heroes within uh, Greek and Roman narrative charms. And, but however, sometimes you would find narrative charms that don't really draw on myths at all. You, you could find uh, narrative charms that only speak about, for instance, uh, I mentioned one in the book where, uh, which is an ancient Roman charm that just speaks about the hunger of a wolf and how that power of the hunger of the wolf is the thing that we want to get hold of, we want to tap into to make use of the narrative charm. So it's not really like they're all based on classical myths. There are other instances where there are no classical myths that are tied to them. So you can only find the story that's outlined in narrative charms within the narrative charm. Actually, I would even say that the majority of them are just stories that are related to in the narrative charms. So you have plenty of narrative charms about, for instance, Jesus riding a horse over a bridge or something like that. And, of course, that's never mentioned in the Bible. So where that, does that come from? And when we look at it, the actual historical uh, sources tells us that it's drawn from an earlier kind of uh, narrative charm, which relates to Odin or Vodan, uh, the ancient Norse god, riding over a bridge. So some of them have classical mythical motives, some others not really much so. And I make the argument in the book that it's rather the, the actual power of them, the power that is embedded within the narrative and the power that, is, that you can tap into by reciting the narrative and the charm in and of itself. That's the main thing of, of the narrative charms, not perhaps the theoretical story or anything like that. Well, Carl, I think this is a perfect uh, transition to some of the great listener questions that we have for you as well, including a listener question for you, Carl, from the wonderful esoteric artist and poet Coleman Stevenson. And Coleman is asking and saying, hello, Carl and Alex. Hello, Coleman. Uh, Coleman says, your book chapter, Carl, Words as Worlds, really got me thinking. The first historiola you cite there, the red maiden with the silken thread sewing the wound, and others throughout the book feel almost as though multi-episodic folktales, what we'd call fairy tales or marchen. 
have been compressed so that all the action and moving from scene to scene are gone, leaving only a call to action, a sequence of motifs, and the inevitable outcomes or punishments. So Coleman's asking, Carl, do you think that these historiole work in part because humans are already steeped in the repetitive structure of longer tales? Do we understand these, Carl, like a form of shorthand because we know the omitted parts by heart? Thank you. Thank you very much, Coleman, for that question. However, I'm not really certain if that is actually the case. I mean, it might help a bit to already know uh, an underlying story or a previous myth or something like that, a longer kind of myth to understand the narrative charm. But then again, I think that's mainly on sort of a theoretical level. I think the main thing to understand is what's going on in the incantation in and of itself. The narrative that's presented in the historiola, not really the perhaps an, a previous underlying myth. And I don't think that's essential for you to use it either. I think the main aspect is is what's actually going on within just the short snippet that you get in the historiola because that's a full in and of itself it's a complete incantation in and of itself i mean there again is plenty of examples of historiola that don't make use of longer narratives that just are the full uh, story is just to be found in historiola so I don't think really it's an essential thing. To that point, tell me if I'm thinking about or or expressing the the difference, say, between a charm and, say, ceremonial magic, for example. So let's say that you are looking to attract a partner in a romantic relationship. In ceremonial magic, you would perhaps say, okay, there's this spirit who can help me attain or become involved in a relationship with somebody, I'm going to fast for nine days. I'm going to go through this uh, period of purification. I'm going to step into a consecrated circle. There's going to be a, an involved evocatory or invocatory procedure. Once the spirit, if the spirit is successfully conjured, I will issue a charge for the spirit to help in this specific request. And then after a certain number of days uh, or longer, the charge will either be executed or it will not be depending on the success of the operation in the future. But what you're saying, Carl, is if you say are using a charm, the charm, instead of looking towards a future result based on a present request, the charm goes all the way back to, as you say, this historiola, some kind of narrative where it's, it's already done. In other words, quoting a narrative where, and this is the person who found true love, and this is the person who is in a relationship and it was done, and you are the person, you are the mythical or a uh, person from uh, history who has done this, so may it be. You know, like it's it's pretty much like this very immediate potency. Is that a somewhat fair or somewhat accurate way to think about the difference between, say, charms and, and ceremonial magic? At least from my point of view, the, the sort of magical operations that you can find, for instance, in the grimoires, if, if that's the sort of ceremonial magical uh, approach that you're speaking about, is very much of a almost like a foolproof method of magic that involves a lot of tools and a lot of uh, sort of safeguards. So you have the whole package basically in, in place. It's a long and arduous procedure, but it's a way to sort of uh, protect yourself from all kinds of errors. So it's very systematic compared to a lot more hands-on approach that you can find within folk magical systems. Folk magical systems, although they usually combine these kind of charms many times with other forms of, of magical practice. So we almost like stack things on top of each other. You would have a charm, for instance, and then you perhaps would perform something physically. You would first perform a divination uh, or something and to see 
when or where you should or how you should uh, undertake the operation, then you might want to craft a doll or something, a puppet perhaps, and then you would perhaps like to collect certain kind of ingredients or some kind of herbs or uh, whatnot, and basically collect a variety of, of uh, sort of um, tools that you need for the practice. Then you would undertake the operation, sort of calling on certain spirits and, and so on, whilst you undertake you know, it performs certain practices on perhaps this puppet whilst reciting the charms. The charms are not only as read or used as a singular practice, they're usually combined with something else. However, they, they function quite well just on their own. Uh, they don't have to be combined with anything else. I mean, ceremonial magic, I think many times draw on very similar kind of methodologies However, they are all completely systematized compared to more folk magical practices, which are a little bit more ad hoc, I would say. They're a little, little bit more experimental. That's, of course, a completely generic statement. And I, I completely understand that a lot of people might not agree with me here. But uh, as far as I understand things, that's usually uh, how I, I approach the difference between the two systems. We have another listener question for you from Maria about looking towards the past. And Maria is saying, Hi, Carl. I love your book as it's really helped me explore my own folk traditions. And Maria is saying, My question is, Carl, can you please share how looking back to the past deeds and actions of magical or mythical beings, Thor, Jesus, Mary, etc., is key to the procedure? Uh, thank you very much, Maria, for, for that great question. I, I think that she really got the key points of the book, because indeed, I think that the most essential part of these narratives are the actions that are described. It's about the potency and the energy and the power of these actions that are displayed by the mythical characters. And although they are sort of given in the narrative charms as past deeds, I think the main thing for us to remember as practitioners is that we shouldn't approach them as past deeds. We should approach them as sort of living actions in the here and now. They, they should not be seen as something that's unrelatable or something that's in a sphere different to ours. It should be seen as a potency or energy, which can be tapped into, which can be understood, and which can be materialized and made available in a given situation in the here and now. So, yeah, I think this is also the beauty of the charms in many ways, that they are not uh, rigid. They display a movement. They display something that's happening. And magic is very much about making things happen. <laughs> It's not about enforcing rigidity or, or saying that things happen in a, in a distant past or something like that. It, they're about making things happen in the here and now. It's all about their practicality. And the narrative charms uh, really, really emphasize action, movement, practicality, and power. You know, Carl, this leads to a, another listener question we have for you from Spectro Poetics. And Spectro Poetics is asking, and saying, quote, I would love to hear Carl's thoughts on hyperstitions and hyper sigils, rupture or continuation with the historiola. Spectro Poetics is saying, throughout the book, Carl emphasizes the importance of tradition and locality. It seems the charms work in large part because the practitioner is embroiled in a magical system and cultivates their inherent affinities with specific shapes and patterns of power. The modern hypersigil seems to do away with these references. The magician sets a precedent to the desired outcome with seemingly no origin point but themselves. So Spectro Poetics is asking, any thoughts, Carl, on the underlying metaphysics? And thank you for this wonderful book. Thank you very much, Spectro Poetics, for that, for that question. 
in all honesty, I, I never even heard about uh, hyper sigils or hyperstition before I, I heard this question. So I might not be able to really do it justice. But as far as I, I know or I have understood things, hyperstitions and hyper sigils are something that's quite related to like postmodern magical approaches like chaos magic and so on. And I think they are more along the lines of functioning within, let's say, a metaphysical paradigm closer to variations of modern psychoanalysis or similar, where you're talking more about like effects of an unconscious mind and, and things like that. And also they more make use of perhaps groups of people so you would want several different people to sort of approach these hyper sigils or hyperstitions and interact with them to get them results you don't really get this in the historiola the historiola are practiced by sole practitioners by a single person and they function more on a metaphysical spectrum if I'm just going to be sort of general about it, that's more related to a sort of a classic idea of magical potency, where you don't really have to have another person in the room uh, for these things to work. They sort of work on a more subtle level, you could say. So the target, so to speak, the person that's going to be affected by the narrative charm doesn't even have to be present or doesn't even have to interact with it, at least not on a sort of conscious level. So uh, I think there's definitely differences between the two. To that point, Carl, about the deeper tradition and, and really understanding things, you share about how the language itself of one charm, say to treat a specific ailment or a health problem or an illness, that that language can also be substituted to treat another health issue or another ailment or another illness. Can you just share about the malleability of these charms? How can they be substituted or maybe the language modified or borrowed? Can you, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. When we look at the textual sources and the history of many of these charms, we see that they indeed have changed a lot over time. They have evolved according to their cultural context or the needs of the uh, practitioner. So you can definitely see that, for instance, as I related to earlier, some charms might have included characters like Odin or Thor in, in the past, but now have characters like Jesus or uh, the Virgin Mary as the main protagonist. Also, the purposes of the charms, the same structure that you can find in a previous charm can change and evolve into different things. So you can find some that's been used in the past to perhaps cure uh, a migraine and or in a different culture, they're used to ward off the evil eye or similar kind of more, let's say, spiritual ailments. So there is definitely an evolution going on, or at least a malleability of these charms in that sense, that the same kind of narrative can be mended with and can be changed so that it's more suitable for a new situation, a new cultural context, etc. It's also worth mentioning that, for instance, in a Choldom tradition, you could use the same kinds of charms to heal both animals as well as humans. So the idea is basically that the affliction is basically the same. So in other words, it doesn't really matter if there is a human being or an animal that's that is in need of curing. Both of them can sort of undergo the same kind of treatment and be, be well afterwards. So you would use the same charm to, to cure both animals as well as humans. So these days, I wouldn't say that we change a lot in the structure. It's rather that we would use the same charm to do a plethora of different things. So even though 
a Sharma might explicitly talk about that it's used to cure, I don't know, toothache, it could still be used to cure psychological or spiritual affliction. So even though in the past they definitely have been uh, changes done to the charms and they have been, there have been changes going on, uh, these days I wouldn't say that that's that common on a day-to-day basis or on a practical basis. I never change a single word of the charm that I'm using. I would use the same charm to cure as to harm, basically. So, yeah, that's a, kind of an interesting twist to it, I suppose. And it perhaps doesn't make that much sense to an outsider, really. But as a practitioner, it makes quite a lot of sense, in all honesty. Carl, some of the charms that you share in Historiola, in your wonderful book, are so visual as well. I mean, visualizing, you know, moving through a field, walking here, encountering a figure sitting there. And I think this question of the importance of the visual ties into a listener question we have for you from Wilma. And Wilma is asking and saying, hi, Carl, does a charm carry more magical potency if the narrative includes visual descriptions and physical movement instructions? Or have you, Carl, found in your experience that charms with just the historical figures is enough to achieve the desired result? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, That's a great question. In all honesty, I don't really know. Uh, (laughs) I think it's very much up to each and every one of us to to figure out what works for us. In one way, I think it might be a benefit if it has some kind of visual aid, so to speak, the narrative. But then again, these are occult things. They are not logical all the time. Sometimes some narrative charms really, really speak out to you, and you don't really know why exactly. It's difficult to say that there is like one-size-fits-all kind of approach to these things. You just have to sort of try them out yourself and see what works for you. If more, you know, full-on imagery will help you, then then just go for it. But uh, I think seriously that it's quite individual on with what works for you and what doesn't. Carl, to Wilma's point too, um, when it comes to the primacy of the invocatory word, the word that must be either whispered or spoken or vibrated in, in the charm tradition, we have a listener question for you from Daryl. And, and Daryl is asking and saying, Historiola really helped me understand the Scandinavian tradition so much better. My question for Carl is, Can Carl elaborate on the use of breath and breathing in narrative charms? Daryl says, I'm a practitioner of hoodoo, and many times the breath or cigar smoke, for example, is blown into a mojo bag in order to amplify its magical potency. Any thoughts on this, Carl? Thank you very much for that question. That's a fantastic question and extremely interesting, actually. I mean, that's a book in and of itself, I think, speaking about the power of the breath and in conjunction with the the power of the spoken word or even just the whisper or something like that. In the Trollum tradition, actually, we also have a very, very similar practice and we have something called troll bags, (laughs) which are very much the same as, I suppose, mojo bags. Uh, You could even say that the word mojo and the word troll might actually have a lot of similarities in that sense, where we would put together a a bag with sort of magical ingredients or uh, pieces of, I don't know, dead animals or or things like that and herbs or whatnot. And then the person that uses it will have to breathe on it uh, on a daily basis. And of course, in the Trollum tradition, these narrative charms are usually not spoken out loud, because it's thought that we would give away the power if somebody else would hear them. And this, of course, 
is related to why we would rather whisper them or uh, we would just speak out perhaps a small part of the narrative charm whilst performing it so we don't speak them out loud properly so that other people can hear them. Another way of doing this is sort of speaking them with clenched teeth, sort of muttering them or whispering them into our mouths with our teeth clenched. And then we contain them within the mouth, so to speak, and then we can blow them out uh, like a, a breath of air. And we would blow them on perhaps the target the, the, or a person or uh, into a glass of water or alcohol or similar. And then we would apply this, this substance to the target or the person or whatever. That's kind of an effective way of making use of them, not just sort of speaking them out loud into space or whatever, but actually directing the uh, magical power. But of course, we can also talk about the idea of the living breath and what breath actually is thought to be in many of these traditions. I mean, the word breath in ancient Greek is pneuma or pneuma. And of course, it's related to the word yeah, spirit. And you find a similarity within ancient Hebrew myth of, uh, of the Ruach and uh, this, the breath of God and so on, or that this is basically the uh, fundamental life force of, of a human being or what actually constitutes life uh, and spirits in and of itself. And then applied into a magical context this is one of the main things that we make use of. I mean, spirit and the power of the spoken word as living spirit, living intelligence that can be applied in certain circumstances. And there's loads to just unravel in and of itself within the confines of, of this discussion. But I think I can leave, leave it at that, though. You know, Carl, that's wonderful context and before I started reading your book, I had this idea of you know someone who truly is a, a very experienced practitioner of using these charms as when they encounter someone with an ailment, they have this register of 500, 600 charms that they have memorized and they might pull out a dozen of them. But something that you say in the book is that practitioners normally do not use more than one or two troll formulae on a regular basis. Can you share why that is? Why, why is it sometimes a limited number of troll formulae? Well, I mean, uh, that's just the way I've been taught, basically. I'm certain that other practitioners might have a, a quite large register of these charms. I'm not certain, really. And I would be happy to hear if other people do. However, uh, from my point of view, I only use one, uh, <laughs> which might sound strange to a lot of people because obviously I, I work professionally to take care of, uh, of client work. So, so people come to me with many different kinds of afflictions and ask for help basically with, with getting rid of them, be it for like the evil eye or for curses or for psychosomatic issues or, or what have you. But the thing is that I think that for me personally, I've seen the power and the effect of the charm. And when that sort of thing unlocks for you, when you understand the potency and the effectiveness of it in a direct situation, then you can apply that potency to a variety of situations and a variety of afflictions, a variety of problems. And it's almost like you don't really need that much more variety. <laughs> if you have a certain tool which can accomplish to, for instance, take away something, then it doesn't need to be quite specific what it takes away. You just have the effect of getting rid of something bad. And then you don't really have to think more about it than that. So yeah, it's almost like a rifle or something. You can shoot a variety of, of animals with it. That's a nasty example, I know. But 
I think it's uh, at least a way for you to sort of get hold of the way we think about using just one charm. I mean, another metaphor might be if you have the power of heat, for instance, then you can apply that heat to accomplish a variety of things like cooking, but also lighting things up or applying it to both your body, but also to heating up your home or whatnot. So, yeah, I only make use of one charm, but I would love to hear more uh, from people if they use variety of them to for each and single different new situation or affliction that they might might approach. We have a listener question for you from Javier, and Javier is asking and saying, Carl's book was really thought-provoking. I'm wondering, Javier says, what Carl thinks scholars get wrong when it comes to narrative charms. Carl mentions in the book that they, quote, disregard the means, methods, and circumstances they were recited, unquote. Was this intentional, Javier says, Carl, or why did this happen? And thanks. Thank you, Javier, for that question. It's very good. Yeah, when doing research on on this topic, I read quite a few articles and uh, material from extremely well-versed scholars within religious studies. But the thing is that these are scholars of religious history, and as such, they are historians and interested mainly in historical sources, historical texts. And they approach this subject usually as basically as historical artifacts. They are not really interested in looking at it from a yeah, contemporary perspective where you actually have people around these days that practice these things. So they don't have, let's say, more of a perhaps an anthropological kind of approach to things or a phenomenological approach to these things, because most probably they have never encountered them in a modern setting. They only read about them through textual evidence from ancient sources or early modern sources or what have you, but they most probably have never actually seen them in use or spoken to anybody who has actually practiced these things on a day-to-day basis for many years or something like that. So it most probably it's quite difficult for them to get a genuine insight into what's actually going on. And then they usually complement this with their own kind of theories, which are quite interesting and and thought-provoking. However, I would say that they miss out on quite a lot of essential details from the perspective of a practitioner. And I mean, there's a genuine problem with some of their approaches because they are usually quite reductionistic. And what I mean with that is that they have philosophical models. And usually in this case, the model would be something along the lines of postmodern language theory, like a post Wittgensteinian kind of language theory, where they would have this main theory, this main kind of system of thought that they try to fit the practice within rather than, let's say, expand the theory to understand the phenomena in question. What I'm trying to say is that as a practitioner, I notice that there are some extremely interesting things going on within the, if we approach them from a philosophical perspective, that would actually mean that a theory of language or a theory of mind has to be sort of expanded to explain these practices. However, the scholars that I've read actually do the opposite. They kind of reduce the practice to fit into the the theoretical model that they make use of. That's something that I felt a little bit at pains with when reading these, uh, these scholars, that they don't really take the practice serious and they try to approach them from a more reductionistic perspective. I mean, it's a little bit like you have a historian that wants to understand, I don't know, how people made ships 
back in antiquity, and they would have no interest in consulting someone who constructs ships these days. Uh, again, that's a pretty bad metaphor, but I think you'll get the gist of what, what I'm trying to say here. Thank you, Carl, for sharing that. That really does put things into context. And we do have uh, another question for you from Coleman Stevenson, Carl, who Coleman was chatting earlier about the topics of humans being steeped in the repetitive structure of longer tales, but that the charms, they're basically made in a compressed way so that all the action and the moving from scene to scene are gone, leaving only a, a call to action and a sequence of motifs and inevitable outcomes. And Coleman's follow-up question for you, Carl, is, I would love to hear, Coleman says, anything Carl has to say in relation to The Long Hidden Friend. His book has really changed the way I look at that text in such a helpful way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Coleman. That's a great question. In all honesty, Long Hidden Friend is uh, something I don't really know that much about. It's, of course, something that you find in the American folk magical tradition, which I guess draws on earlier North uh, European or German, if I'm not incorrect, the kind of sources. And I mean, it's an extremely fascinating book in and of itself, but I'm a complete novice when it comes to Long Hidden Friend. I've just sort of glanced at it mainly. But of course, within the Long Hidden Friend, you, you find plenty of examples of Historiola. And uh, many of them are, are very similar to what you find in, in the Scandinavian tradition and in the British tradition as well. It's a wonderful starting point, perhaps, for American practitioners that want to dig deeper uh, into narrative charms within their own tradition because they can just investigate the long hidden friend. I went through the long hidden friend now beforehand and uh, I found this charm that I would like to sort of read out. And it's charm against burns. And it goes something along the lines of Our dear Lord Jesus Christ going on a journey saw a firebrand burning. It was St. Lorenzo stretched out on a roast. He rendered him assistance and consultation. He lifted his divine hand and blessed the brand. He stopped it from spreading deeper and wider. Thus may the burning be blessed in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. So there you have a narrative charm where this St. Lorenzo is healed by Jesus. And I suppose what you can make out of it is that you have this situation where you have a known kind of trope, but that's only a known trope within perhaps a Catholic context. And in all honesty, I never even heard about St. Lorenzo before uh, looking into this charm. Sweden is a Lutheran country, so perhaps you wouldn't even find anything similar in, in Scandinavian tradition. But the thing is that I don't think it's necessary really to know who St. Lorenzo is. I still sort of get the gist of what, what's going on. And then again, St. Lorenzo and the background story, something along the lines of that St. Lorenzo was almost burnt like a piece of, of meat before he uh, died and accomplished his martyrdom. But I think that as a practitioner, you don't really need to know the story, the full story. You can still apply it. However, the charm has been structured in this way, perhaps to fit within a specific cultural context so that it's a bit more accessible for a person within perhaps a Catholic context. However, I don't think it's essential that you would know who San Lorenzo is or the exact legend of his martyrdom. I think it's mainly essential that there is somebody who's in the threat of being burnt or has been burnt and a powerful figure like Jesus comes and takes care of the problem. That's the main, main aspect of it. You know, Carl, your book, Historiola, is such an intuitive and, and very succinct summary and exposition, really, of 
the charm tradition and narrative charms. And I think there might be listeners out there who definitely I, I encourage to pick up a copy of your book and they might be wondering, do you have any tips, Carl, for people if they want to construct their own troll formulae? You know, how can we go about using and accessing these? Are there any any tips or any advice or or anything at all that you'd like to share? Well, I wouldn't really advise people to perhaps construct their own ones. I do believe actually that there is a certain kind of imbued potency within the charms themselves. They have been used and tried and tested within given traditions for hundreds of years. And why sort of reinvent the wheel when you perhaps can get that all for free many times by sort of approaching them as they are themselves? So still, I mean, the best way would be to actually find a teacher that has actually made use of these charms and can sort of give one to you or transfer one to you in a proper setting. Of course, that's extremely rare. But I think the best way, if you can't do that or accomplish that, then I think look into the charms that you can find within your own tradition. I mean, it's quite a universal practice. So you should be able to find uh, plenty of Anglo-Saxon charms, plenty of uh, even Gaelic or Indian or Latin or Roman or Scandinavian, um, what have you. So I think you should be able to find plenty of textual sources where you can find these charms. And then just sort of try a few of them out. See what, which one that actually resonates with you. See which one that you can actually get into and understand and look into the elements that are present within the charm and see how they resonate with you on a quite a direct level. For me personally, I did something quite similar and it took me, I don't know, a few tries. Uh, in the beginning, I, I started off with some of them that just sounded interesting and compelling and, and perhaps a bit cool to me. But I actually ended up with something that I perhaps wouldn't have approached immediately. <laughs> it, it, it didn't sound as interesting at first glance, but it, it sort of, when trying it out, when sort of going deep into it, perhaps even calling on the spirits that are present within the narrative and seeing how the actions that they undertake within the narrative unfold and what happens within your space or within your mind or when applied into a given situation, given uh, context, then it sort of unlocks for you. And that's when you know uh, that you're on the right track, basically. So yeah, go for it. Find some, try them out and see what happens. What are some of the biggest misconceptions about narrative charms that Maybe you'd like people to avoid, or if maybe they were thinking about it, maybe you know, gently present them with the correct information, or, or what are some things that people assume about charms that are definitely not the case? I think one of the biggest misconceptions about these charms would be that it's all about a kind of a precedence, that it's something along the lines of that as a magical practitioner or a deity or something had performed these things in a past situation. That is why they are working now. I would say that at least on a theoretical level, uh, they should not be approached as sort of sympathetic, actually. I think that that is kind of a mistake I see all the time when reading about these terms, that both scholars and many, I've even seen practitioners think about these charms as about precedence. Whilst I think something that we must get used to think about is that we're talking about magical potencies that are present always. They're always here directly. And all we have to do really is open ourselves up to them and, and find them and approach them genuinely 
And that is the, the main, the core of the practice. And I think this can actually not just be applied to charms or narrative charms. I think it's something that we should actually think about more and more within a spectrum of magical practices that we are not pulling things out from a past or we're not pulling things out from some kind of ether or whatever. These are forces and powers that are always at hand. It's just that we have perhaps, we're not aware of them. We're not secure in our present mental state or what have you, but they are always approachable. They, they can always be apprehended if we just sort of reach out for them. I guess to ask the question in the negative or to ask the question in the reverse, Carl, given all that, what are some of the big things that you would like people to always remember when working with narrative charms or anything they should always keep in mind, either practical tips or theoretical tips, anything at all that you'd like to share? Something that people perhaps could always try and remember is that it's the efficiency of the charms that should always remain in focus. It's the effect. I mean, this is something, again, that's quite necessary always to uh, keep in mind when approaching the magical practice. It's, it's, it's a practice. It's the effect that's the main thing, you know. It's not really about playing around with things in your head. It's about seeing an actual effect, understanding that these things actually have a power to change things, to make things happen, and keeping your, your eye on the efficiency. That's the main thing, because sooner or later, a practitioner of these charms or many other kinds of, of magical practices will not really have to think that much when doing them. They just become some tool that you can pick up and use quite easily. And it's not really that you have to sit around and visualize things or analyze them or anything like that, but rather they become quite natural. And then it's only the effect that's of value to you. It's not really the tool in and of itself. It's, it's about the, the efficiency and how efficient it is. Carl, your book, Historiola, it's wonderful. The context, the history, the, the practical application. Is there anything else, Carl, that you would like to share either about Historiola or any upcoming projects that you're working on or just anything at all that, that's currently at the front of your consciousness right now? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I don't really have any upcoming projects, to be honest. However, I do have my own practice. So I help out with clients and things like that. And you can find me at the rootdoctor.se. That's sort of a small practice where me and a couple of other practitioners of traditional Scandinavian folk magic offer our services to clients. So you can find me there. And if people are interested in, in the subject of narrative charms, I think there's plenty of uh, historical material out there. You can just try and search it, search it yourself. However, if they want to learn more about trolldom and Scandinavian folk magic, I would highly recommend them reading my teacher, uh, Johannes Bjorn Gordbeck's book, Trolldom which is a fantastic sort of exposition of, of this tradition. I know he also offers a lot of courses, online courses and things like that. If you're interested in the actual practice of it, uh, I would highly recommend you looking into that. There's also a couple of other books that are out there, like, for instance, Revelor Publishing in, in the States have done a reissue of an extremely informative PhD article by Thomas Johnson that's called Svartkonstböcker, uh, which is a compendium of Swedish black art books. And then I believe they're also going to do yet another republication of the same author's work, which is called, I think, The Graveyard Wanderers or something. 
that should be also highly informative for any, anyone who is interested in the Scandinavian folk magical tradition. So, yeah, those are the things that I would recommend to people looking into. Well, listeners, definitely make sure to check out the podcast and video descriptions for all of the resources that Carl was sharing about, as well as the link to Hadian Press to order Historiola, The Power of Narrative Charms. Carl Nordblom, practitioner, esotericist and author. Carl, thank you so much just for taking a little bit of time today and sharing with the listeners about Narrative Charms on the podcast today. Truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. A huge, huge thanks to Carl Nordblom for sharing about the power of narrative charms. I really love how Carl's practical experience and research really illuminate how charms give us an immediate access, a pathway to heal or hex by drawing on Historiola, and also how the procedures for the charms differ from ceremonial magical operations. So make sure definitely to check out Carl's book by visiting the link to Hadian Press below. And to each and every podcast supporter on patreon.com slash glitchbottle, thank you, thank you, thank you. You make this podcast possible and you help it continue to grow in new and interesting ways. And if you're listening right now, and if you so dare to jump on the Glitch Bottle caravan, please consider becoming a supporter of Glitch Bottle with extra exclusive perks just for you and also putting up with my nerdy self in the links below. As always, this is Alexander Eth reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. 